Welcome, everything is fine. You are listening to Forking Bullshirt, the Good Place podcast. I'm Vivian. And I'm Jason. We'll be the architects of your journey into the afterlife. Today we're talking about Season 1, Episode 12, Mindy St. Clair. It was written by Megan Amram and Jen Statsky, directed by Dean Holland, and it was aired January 19th, 2016. This was the first part of a two-part finale, but we are going to split them up and talk about episode 13, our finale, next week. Yeah, we might have a special guest. Yeah, get excited. I apologize right at the beginning here because I am a bit sick, so my voice might sound a little weird this episode, but we're going to power through because we're it's heroes. a pretty great one. Big damn heroes. Yes. Yeah. All right, so we'll get started. We open on a flashback of Eleanor during her final moments on Earth. She's at the grocery store, loading up her cart, preparing for a weekend alone. She kneels down in the parking lot to pick up an item when she spots a line of shopping carts coming right for her. We flash back to Eleanor, Jason, and Janet in the train on their way to the neutral zone. So, I would watch a show just of Eleanor doing day-to-day things. (laughs) What? Absolutely, 100%. I would just sit down and watch a half-hour show, hour show. Hell, I'd watch a movie. Of Eleanor just being jerks to people. I love it. Okay. So when she rams the card into the, the Lululemon off, lady. <laughs> Lululemon. <laughs> it's great. I like this flashback. It's loaded with a lot of little details. So, for example, Frank Sinatra's My Way is playing during that flashback. And the clearest lines that you can hear are, And now the end is near, and so I face the final curtain. My friend, I'll say it clear. I'll state my case of which I'm certain. And it's just (laughs) perfect. It's so on the nose. Oh, it's so on the nose, but I love it. It's Mm -hmm. like this great tie into Eleanor's situation in The Good Place. And if you're not paying attention to the lyrics, then that's fine. It's just kind of a sad song in Mm -hmm. her final moments. But the lyrics themselves are very poignant at Mm -hmm. this moment. They are not subtle. No. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. I'm totally fine with that. What other things did you notice? I also noticed that the Lonely Girl Margarita Mix for one, its tagline is, you don't need them anyway. (laughs) (laughs) It's just perfect. I love when prop masters go above and beyond and just add more into it Mm -hmm. so that when you do look for stuff like we do, it's there. It's there. There's something. Uh, She also bought lightly expired shrimp, which of course we know that she loves seafood in general. Right there, like, you're toying with death already, I would think. I don't Mm -hmm. know. I have not eaten expired seafood or seafood of any kind in, like, 14 years, so. (laughs) That's a lot of shrimp, though. That ring of shrimp is huge. Yes. That's like a party for 20. Mm Mm-hmm. There's also a magazine right next to the one that she picks up with a photo of Tahani on the cover, and it says, British socialite Tahani Al-Jamil. Not just Camilla's sister. <laughs> I missed that. Yeah, that that's a good one. And this is a subtle, subtle reference here. On the back cover of Celebrity Baby Plastic Surgery Disasters, there's an ad for a perfume called Glide by Dennis Feinstein. It's a very subtle Parks and Rec reference. So they're in the same universe. I guess so. I like that idea. Maybe if Eleanor had met Leslie Nope she would be a better person because Leslie is pretty damn fantastic. Mm. And Eleanor has that great line where she's like, oh, live every day like it's your last. Bitch, I'm going to live forever. You know, and of course she dies immediately. Yeah. Um, But I I stopped on that moment. I paused and I looked at her horoscope and she is a Libra. Yep. And her horoscope says, think you are skating by without anyone noticing? Dream on. Your energy is too vibrant to remain unnoticed. With Mars and Saturn in alignment, it's time to live every day like it's your last. Lucky numbers 1, 23, 58. So the whole you think you're skating by without anyone noticing is perfect. Yeah, for her you know? time in a good place. Exactly. Everyone's noticing what you're doing. All of your actions are being counted. Um, and not only that, but the lucky numbers are actually the numbers of the good place neighborhood. Really? Yeah. So it's the good place neighborhood one twenty three fifty eight. Okay. Yeah. I definitely missed that. They're going for like a lost feel where like the numbers actually have something mm-hmm. to do with it. Although I was trying to figure out if the numbers actually had some sort of hidden message. 
And I couldn't think of anything. I was trying to like match them with letters of the alphabet. And no, it just no. doesn't. No, there's mm. nothing. At least as far as I can tell. If there is a listener out there who's just like screaming at their headphones right now, like, how do you not know? They're there's into a cryptography. Huge secret. Oh man, if you're into cryptography, tell me about that. You're like a code breaker. Yeah, I want to know. I want to know. There are podcasts out there that like do that kind of stuff or that have secret messages. Like if you listen to ours, Paradoxica, they have secret messages at the end. It's pretty cool. Anyway. We should do that. I'm you not going to do that. Lift, lift, <laughs> Luca, ha, flip. Play it backwards, <laughs> listeners. I dare you. Oh, God. Yeah, we, yeah. If you play it backwards, we tell you all the secrets. <laughs> have fun. And that's pretty much all I noticed in in this flashback. Mm-hmm. What did you think of it uh, as a whole? I really like the flashback. Yeah? Yeah. Other than just, like, finding it funny? Yeah. I mean, that's the main reason I like it, because it's entertaining. And we also get a little bit extra at the end. Eleanor seems off mm -hmm. to me. Okay. When she's with the cashier and outside talking to the, the whale humper. <laughs> she seems sad. She does. She's very defensive. And yeah, just seems like something's off. Yeah. Actually, I didn't really notice like her emotions in that flashback. I was so focused on everything else that mm -hmm. was going on. Mm -hmm. But I was talking to my friend Allie, who is a host over on Lost Watch, which is a great Lost podcast. She pointed out that Eleanor seems really different and she seems depressed. Like, when she's in the grocery store itself and she's pushing all the things into the cart and she's hitting everybody with her with her cart and grabbing all this stuff, like, even her attitude before seeing anyone mm -hmm. or before directly interacting with anyone is down. Yeah, it really is. The so way she, like, yeah. pulls the chips into the cart, it's just... Which is a fantastic thing, yeah, but it, she looks depressed. She's on autopilot and she's just... Yeah. yeah. And we're seeing her... Alone. You're like fairly alone, right? When you're at the grocery store, you're not thinking, oh, this is a social interaction no, yeah, time. yeah, you're in your own zone for sure. Yeah. And it's kind of, I think the first time we really see her like that and to see that she's kind of listless and unhappy mm -hmm. is telling. It's a I little think. depressing. Yeah, it is. Hidden in with all the humor. Mm-hmm. And the environmentalist, when he asks her, why are you like this? First of all, it's the first beat of that in this episode. We will have three. But it made me think that this is something that she's probably heard many, many times in her life. Oh, yeah. And that's why she's so defensive. She, like, blows up on him. Oh, she really does. Mm -hmm. Like, why am I like this? You don't know anything about me. And, of course, we'll learn pretty much why she's like this in this episode. It's interesting. It's like, don't judge me. Mm -hmm. And we have Sean literally judging her. Yeah. And that's the thing, too, is... As much as people will say, don't judge somebody, you know, you're passing by on the street because everybody has, you know, their own struggle and they're all going through their own thing. But if someone is being, like, rude to you, you can't kind of really help but judge them. Right. If someone is rude to me it's while I'm driving you. around, uh, they're, like, flipping me off or something like that. Or if someone responded to me the way that Eleanor did, I would be frustrated, too. Mm-hmm. And you can't help but think, well, that person is a jerk. Why are they such a jerk? Yeah. It's a fair question. Mm -hmm. So Eleanor is probably thinking of her last day in this moment when we flash back to her on the train with Jason and Janet. And I wanted to uh, to ask you about the sexy things that uh, that Janet lists off. It's a great list. So she says, Jason taught me about sexy things. All right, so the list of sexy things, I'm definitely going to go over those. Lamborghinis, cool snakes, spinning rims, 20,000 followers on Instagram, girls with pigtails eating lollipops, latex pants, Carl's Jr. ads, and sex. So right off the bat, we don't have a Carl's Jr. in Canada. No. So no idea. I don't know how sexy those ads are. They might be very they sexy. They might be great. But most of those are pretty cool. The, not really sexy. They're they're like cool in like the way that they would be featured in a rap music video. Mm, maybe that's exactly where he's getting his list from. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. I like how Eleanor says, well, some of those are right. Which ones do you think Eleanor finds sexy? I think she would put Lamborghinis on there. Yep. Girls with pigtails eating lollipops. 
Ugh, I don't know. That's just like weird to me. Carl's but Jr. Whatever. adds sex and maybe latex pants. Mm, if Tahani's wearing them, then probably. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yep. Okay. I only put Carl's Jr.'s ads in there because I don't know what they are. <laughs> <laughs> I well, mean, I could look them up, but... Do you know what Carl's Jr.'s yeah, is? Yeah, it's burgers. Okay, yeah, it's yeah. burgers. So like, I guess if you find food sexy? She definitely likes food. Okay, no. well... Food let's... is just good. It's not sexy. The lollipops are just by themselves. They're just lollipops, but throw on pigtails and girls, then they can be sexy. Ugh. I'll, I'm sorry. It's like the only thing I can think of is like a six year old doing that. So then that no. makes it creepy, right? Yeah, well, just don't do that. Okay, yeah, but even if it was a 26 year old woman doing that, I'd be like, uh, can you stop acting like a child? It's just creeping me out. Sorry. Lollipops sorry, are only anyway. for kids? Pigtails are only for kids? It's just not my thing. There you go. Anyway. You heard it here first. You heard it here first. I don't like phallically shaped candy items. Moving right along. Sean sits with real Eleanor, Tahani, Chidi, and Michael to discuss Eleanor's case. Eleanor, Jason, and Janet arrive in the neutral zone and meet Mindy St. Clair, a hotshot lawyer who came up with the idea for a charity while high. In a flashback, Eleanor rejects the birthday celebrations from her co-workers, saying that she would prefer not to owe them anything. Which I totally get. So this actually, this flashback was a little bit weird for me because yeah. when Eleanor first started working there, she had a conversation with the boss saying, you know, I'm not, I don't want to talk to anybody. I'm not here to make friends. I don't, she was very clear on how antisocial she was. Yes. And now suddenly they're throwing birthday party cake at her as an obvious group thing. So it just seemed off to me. No, that's fair, actually. It is kind of weird because her boss does say like, oh, well, we run drills to see how fast we can shred evidence and Mm -hmm. some people go out for drinks after, but maybe it's just more like, well, it's not mandatory, but it's something that certain people do in the office. Mm -hmm. I was almost expecting to see him like be exasperated with the whole thing. Right. I'm just doing this because I'm the boss and I have to look good in front of my employees. It is kind of an odd flashback, but I think... It's one of the better examples of Eleanor's self-imposed solitude. It's not aggressive. It's not mean. It's not... It doesn't hurt anybody. Mm-hmm. It's not putting anybody down. It's not really intentionally insulting people. It's just like, I'm going to do my own thing. So I don't have to owe anybody else anything. Yeah. And it seems very rational. When yeah, she's sure. explaining it to her coworker. she says, well, I know what kind of cake that I like. And then this way, I don't need to chip in. We don't need to, like, do a whole thing where we're exchanging. Mm-hmm. Because really, when you think about it, like, someone will pay for, for your birthday cake, right, at work. But then you go on and pay for somebody else's birthday cake. So it ends up kind of evening out. Yeah. And then some people might say, well, then what's the point? You know, you're not really giving them anything. Yeah. If it all comes back around in full circle anyway. Yeah. Well, for example, my... My family, um, on my dad's side, him and his brothers would exchange gifts. But after a while, it sort of started to feel like, okay, well, here, I give you 50 bucks for Christmas and you give me 50 bucks for Christmas. Why don't we just call the whole thing off? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, there, there was no point. But it literally makes no difference. You might as well just give me my 50 bucks back. Exactly. It just, it makes no difference. Yeah. But... In this moment, like like you said, she's not being mean or aggressive. She's just stating facts. Mm-hmm. So I think I like this one, even though it is kind of weird for this particular workplace to be doing that right. kind of thing. I like Eleanor's interpretation of it. Yeah. And I just think it could be executed a little bit better. Yeah. Okay. And in this flashback, we get our second beat of why is she like this. And the first time we see it in the episode, it's directed to Eleanor herself, and then she's resistant. Um, but in this one, it's not direct to Eleanor. It's just about her. Mm-hmm. But we know that this event came before. Yeah. It's more so. meaningful this time. Mm-hmm. Now that's the friend at the bar, correct? Yes. It is the friend who said, you know, if you if you keep doing this, then you're banned from Thursday night drinks forever. And yeah. Eleanor was like, okay, bye. <laughs> oh, peace. She was not affected. Yeah. So back to uh, our time in the good place. Sean says that this is case number 00003. So if Mindy is one of those previous cases, Mm -hmm. which is likely, then that means there's still another one that we haven't heard about. 
Yeah, I wonder if that's going to be something we're going to explore before the season ends or if we're going to explore it next season. I hope it is. Mm -hmm. Me too. Now, Sean's emotion shell. Yeah. I'm not a fan of that at all. Me neither. Okay, good. Yeah, it doesn't work for me as a joke. I don't think it's funny. It's not funny and it has no purpose. It's just, it just feels like it's just meant to be a joke and it doesn't land. Well, they only use it twice. They have him zip up the first time and then when they react emotionally again, zip up again. But we don't see him again in that cocoon for the rest of the episode, thankfully. Mm Mm-hmm. But personally, I don't really get it because then it kind of messes with my whole idea of what he is. Right. Because cocoons are, that's like an, that's an insect thing, right? Yeah. So I don't know. It just seems really weird. And he keeps talking about being in goo. And I'm like, well, what are you? Why are you in goo? Is that what Michael does when he's not around? Mm -hmm. Like, does he go to bed in a weird cocoon thing every night? It just, it messes with my idea of the world. If it's not brought up and explained and talked about in the future, then it's a huge miss. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah, so maybe they're like crab people or like moth people or something. It's just weird. Yeah, it's And dumb. symbolically, it doesn't do anything either because cocoons are generally meant to symbolize like growth or maturity, transformation, right? Mm-hmm. So this doesn't really work in this instance. Um, I don't mind the joke that he is resistant to emotions. Absolutely, for sure. That's totally fine with me. It's just the effect, like looking at it itself, it just makes me think, what is he, like a Buffy monster of the week or something? Mm -hmm. This just doesn't feel right. Yeah, so not a big fan overall. And I thought it was a little weird that the bad place had the bad Janet plead their case. I think it's possible that they just didn't want to have Adam Scott come in just to do, like, a couple-minute thing. Mm -hmm. I think it's possible that they just wanted to use Darcy Carden because she was already in the episode. Well, we have Adam Scott in the video. Oh, that's true. He doesn't interact with anybody, so that could have been filmed, like, at another time if he wasn't available. Yes. So I I guess I kind of get that, but you're right. It seems strange having Janet plead the case. Yeah. Because... Unless they've kind of given up at that point and they're like, ah, just send Janet. We don't really care that much anymore. (laughs) That's very possible. It's very possible, yeah. I I love seeing bad Janet because she's great. Oh, yeah. And (laughs) I rule the fart inadmissible is pretty cute. And Michael just nodding like, thank you. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. I was worried that was really going to mess up our case. Yeah. That's a really convincing argument. Yes. Very. What did you think of Mindy? I don't really have many emotions for Mindy. (laughs) She's, I don't know. She doesn't seem like she belongs in a medium place. No? To me, she seems... Like a bad place person? Yeah, like worse than Eleanor. I mean, she did a great thing. Well, she came up with the plans for it. She came up with the plans for it. Yeah. And I guess that's the main argument. Mm -hmm. Should she get credit for coming up with the idea? Yeah, I am a little surprised that they had someone who is so obviously terrible. Yeah. In the medium place. But I guess it goes to show that Mindy hasn't really changed. That even though she came up with this plan for a really great charity or foundation, whatever it is. She's still a That she's still, yeah. She's still incredibly selfish. Um, She's still rude and abrasive. And she hasn't grown at all in her afterlife Mm -hmm. because even though she had that big epiphany when she was high as a kite and she did follow through with the plan the Mm -hmm. following morning it's like that that mindy didn't stick around she reverted back to who she was before Mm -hmm. because you would think that if that mindy uh was still around that she would be kinder, gentler with people, that she would be more compassionate, that she wouldn't be asking Eleanor for coke every 5 seconds. Mm-hmm. But she's that person. That's who she is. Right. I mean, she even tells Eleanor, "There's no time for that morality nonsense, sweetheart." By the way, the use of sweetheart is totally a bad person thing. Yep. Pretty At least in this show. She says, "This is about survival. You got to look out for number 1." That's not a person who comes up with a charity. Mm -hmm. That is the hotshot lawyer who's addicted to coke. Yeah. 
you talk about growth and that's interesting because it doesn't seem like that's something that people do in the afterlife and because there's no reason to change who you are if you're sent to the good place you're just good you're sent to the bad place you're bad there's no possibility like why would you need to grow why would you need to change and eleanor is the only example that we know of so far of somebody who's actually attempted to grow and attempted to change who they are only because she's put in a situation where she has to right yes she's put under pressure and that's exactly what you want to do when you're writing like you want to put your protagonist under pressure Mm -hmm. because that's what makes people change yeah yeah. And there's no reason for Mindy to change who she was because she she got the medium place. Yeah. She doesn't need to go anywhere else. She's totally content with being her crappy, medium, coked up self. Watching and, Cannonball Run 2 uh, over and over again. And not only that, but Mindy is living there on her own. So she's not influenced by anyone else, mm-hmm. right? Whereas Eleanor has cheaty to guide her through her yes. her growth. But Mindy, I guess I get what you mean, because Mindy, why would she grow? Yeah, she She's doesn't. not doing it for anyone else's benefit. And morality is generally how you should behave when, and treat other people, right? right. So Take people out of the equation. And if there's nobody to treat better or worse, then you just live your life you as exist. who you are. Yeah. You know, I feel like maybe Mindy is like her, the truest person here. Because she's not influenced by anybody. Mm -hmm. She's just her. Yeah. She's the only one who's going to be around. So she can just do exactly what she wants to do. Interesting. Yeah. I'm not saying she's a good person. Just maybe the truest. Right. It's possible. It's, It's something to think about anyway. So let's talk for a minute about the medium place and Mindy's house. Okay. A lot of the items that she's been given and adjustments that Trevor has made just seem really crappy. Like, it doesn't seem like a medium place to me. Seems like worse than that? It seems worse. She's not being tortured. No, she's not. She has her own home. She can garden. She has terrible 80s clothes. She can masturbate whenever she likes, which is apparently all the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't seem like hell. No, that's true. She only has the Eagles to listen to. Oh, the live versions. versions. I hate the live versions of songs, just in general. I don't understand that. I like live versions. I don't. Because it captures the feeling of the crowd and the energy that the band is putting into their performance. Yeah, but it always sounds a little off. Yes, it does. That's what it bugs me. Hmm. It's because I know the song, how it's supposed to be sung and everything and then if i hear it live it's just like oh some people would there's say just that's something the weird about version it of the song oh okay because okay because it's being performed in front of people and without any editing and effects and it's just them yeah i don't know i'm gonna be a real crank about it <laughs> sorry i just don't like live versions that's fair yep i guess the part to me that seems most like the medium place is closer to the bad side is that she's alone. Mm -hmm. I think if I had to live for 30 years, even if it's just your afterlife, which 30 years in the span of eternity is minuscule, right? Right. It's still so much time alone. I would get very lonely. I am definitely an introvert. I like my time to myself. I like to do my own thing. But if I was alone that long, I would definitely be insane. Mm -hmm. Like. And I like that Eleanor asks that and that's a dress. Like, don't, aren't you lonely? Yeah. She's like. just. Nope. I'm good. Yeah, don't you want company? Like, after 30 years of not seeing anyone? No, I'm good. Okay. All right. That is a weird reaction to have. Okie dokie. <laughs> you do you, girl. I guess, yeah. All right, we'll continue. Sean listens to the monotone arguments of Eleanor's friends, and Michael then reviews the memories of fake Eleanor with the group. I like Tahani's description. Kristen Stewart on the red carpet level of emotionless. It's pretty fantastic. I mean, that's good. That's good. No hate on Kristen Stewart, but she's just got that very blank face. Yep. Yeah. Which works for her. Yeah. It's her aesthetic, I guess. It's her vibe. 
We know what we're <laughs> going to get from Kristen Stewart, and it's not going to be a lot of excitement. That's okay, though. Yeah, it's predictable. Yeah. But a good way, not like a bad thing. Be yourself, Case Stu. <laughs> <laughs> That is definitely not the episode title. No. Be yourself, Case Stu. No, definitely not. Um, I did notice Eleanor's date of birth. So we finally find out her age. Mm-hmm. She was born September 14th, 1982. So she died at the age of 34. Okay. Mm-hmm. I was starting to wonder, because the cake that we see in one of those fla- flashbacks had the number 29 on it, and I thought, oh... Did she really die before she was 30? Is that possible? But no, it's uh, it's a few years after that. Yeah, so we get a few snippets of, I guess we're going backwards in time from the moment of her death at the beginning. Yes. Going back to what oh, we yeah. see later on in the episode. Yeah, counterclockwise. Yes. <laughs> backwards chronologically? Whatever, that, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's interesting... That Sean immediately pulls up Eleanor's life events resulting in the largest negative point values. He doesn't bring up at all, like, the events that gave her the highest uh, positive point values. Yeah, it, it, it seems counterproductive. Yeah, he, it's like he's trying to find a reason to send her to the bad place. He looks like he's trying to. Basically, he's saying she's guilty until proven innocent. Yeah, yeah. And it's totally unfair. mm -hmm. Especially the fact that she shouldn't even be judged pre-good place because we already know that she was supposed to be in the bad place. Mm -hmm. So we already know that she sucks. Yeah. So why are we not looking at her actions in the good place? Because that's what we're judging her on. Yeah. And that's what everyone's arguing is that she's changed now that she's been here. But... He kind of just rejects that entire argument. Right. So when you think about that. it, there's no point, right? Like, it feels like all of their efforts have been totally futile. Right from the start. Yeah. It's like he already knows the verdict. Exactly. Chidi says that she's grown so much and it's been real self-improvement. Um, and he says, you know, I was, I made the decision to help Eleanor that first week and I'm glad I did it because she's worth it. Mm -hmm. But the only reason that she was worth it is because she made progress here, right? Yeah, she made an effort. Mm -hmm. But Sean's just rejecting that argument entirely. He's saying, no, it's just what happened on Earth. Too bad. Yeah. I mean, some of those events were pretty terrible. I mean, were they, though? Like, not all of them were that bad. Um, Compared to, like, things that they could be. Oh, yeah. She didn't kill people. She didn't run over people with her car or, like, set houses on fire or... Okay, are you just thinking of the leftovers now? Because <laughs> those are all things that happen. <laughs> or, you know, like, knocking kids over and drowning babies or being abusive to animals. Like... No, no. But that would have sent her, like, immediately into the bad place, right? Her score would have been way lower than negative 4,000 and something. Sure, but it doesn't matter. Their yeah. score doesn't matter. As long as you pass that threshold, it could be one point under or like a million points under. That's true. That's true. It's very and binary. That's, that's not great. That's mm-hmm. so what we've been arguing this whole season, exactly. basically. And that's what Eleanor's been fighting for as well. Mm-hmm. There should be a medium place. Yes. And Eleanor, you made it. You got there, girl. You got there. Might not be as great as you thought it would be, though. Chidi morphs his face into the most unbelievable shocked frown that i've ever seen it's like a bemused oh my god am i watching something real like this did not just happen it's like watching a really funny train wreck (laughs) yeah Yeah, where nobody gets hurt yeah but for some reason it's hilarious oh my gosh william jackson harper's face just distracts me every time i'm watching that scene because it's so good Mm -hmm. like his, his face is just so funny it's very elastic in that moment like i can't get over how comical the upside down frown is like it's perfect it's just so (laughs) u-shaped like good job on your face william (laughs) i like that eleanor brings photos with her to the medium place she brings one of jason and tahani and she puts that on a shelf and then she brings one of chidi and i like that she puts it right in front of her she's reading and she's got her little stack of books and she brought with her... Her professor's there with her. 
Oh, that's so sad because in her mind, she may never see him again. And it's yeah. just, I'm, ah, I have feelings about it. Anyway, <laughs> she brought what we owe to each other, natural goodness, groundwork on the metaphysics of morals and Nicomachean ethics. So she brought books that we've touched on in this podcast. And it's nice to see that she brings them along with her because that means that she's not done. Right. She doesn't think of herself as done. Right. So this is her first moment of kind of relaxation in the medium place. And that's what she chooses to do. I think that says a lot yeah. of who she has become. And she misses Chidi. And she misses him. And it reminds her of him and class. Very sweet. He's reading a book in the picture. And I'm trying to imagine like, when did Eleanor take this photo? <laughs> Was he just like so engrossed in the book? And then she thought, maybe I'll need a picture. Or she was like, he looks so cute reading. I'll take a picture. I'm going to assume it's the last one. Don't tell me otherwise. <laughs> or she just said, Janet, take a picture of Chidi now. And then Janet snaps a shot and gives her a printout. Where does the print come out? Is it like a Polaroid out of her mouth? Maybe. I was thinking it's unfortunate that Eleanor didn't catch him at that moment, just like coming out of the shower. <laughs> She's like, Janet, I don't know where Chidi is, but can you take a picture of him w with whatever he's doing right now? And it's just him coming out of like a steamy shower Maybe with a towel wrapped around him. Maybe that's she knows that he's surprisingly jacked. Maybe. Oh, God. Eleanor, don't spy on him. Anyway, I was thinking it was like the uh, the Old Spice commercials, but Chidi mm -hmm. instead of, of the course. other guy. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> too bad. Too bad. Anyway, it's him in his natural habitat. I think it's very cute. This discussion is getting uh, dangerously into the sexy zone. <laughs> oh, God. Okay. Good point. Um. <laughs> so after we watch the informational VHS on why Mindy was put in the medium place instead. That really reminded me of an orientation video from Lost. When Mindy is telling Eleanor that the two sides were fighting over her for a really long time, I started thinking, oh, where have I, like, where have I heard this story before? Because I know there's a story and I couldn't tell, I couldn't remember if it was like a biblical story or just something I'd seen in a movie mm -hmm. where heaven and hell are fighting over a soul. And so I asked Alan, who is uh, one of the hosts of Shadows and Chamblers and American Gods podcast, I asked him because he's fairly well versed in religious studies. And he told me it was the book of Job that I was thinking of. Essentially a bet between God and Satan on the piety of Job. Yeah, like how long will he suffer before he stops believing and stops, he loses his faith, basically. Yeah, so in the Bible, Job's family gets killed, his stuff breaks or people around him die. He gets like the plague, mm -hmm. boils... And in this story, Job is super pious, but he's very anxious. He's so careful to follow God's law that he doesn't have any fun. So in this moment, it's like, yeah, he has faith, but he's not enjoying his life, mm -hmm. right? And it's a very different story. Like, Mindy was never religious, as far as we can tell. But I don't know. The whole, the, the idea of, like, two sides fighting over somebody, it's interesting. I see it a little differently. Okay. I don't see the good place fighting over her. Okay. I see the bad place wanting her and the good place only wanting her so she doesn't go to the bad place. Or only so the bad place doesn't get her. I don't think the good place agrees that she belongs in the good place. Okay. I think they just think that she doesn't belong in the bad place. So they don't actively want her in the good place. They just don't want her to go to the bad place. It okay. sounds a little convoluted. Yeah, it's but, like, I don't want you to be tormented for all of eternity. But I don't think you belong in our place. Yeah. So we have to make an exception to our system. Right. To me, she seems worse than Eleanor. I agree. I think she's worse than Eleanor. Okay. Done. Discussion over. All right, let's continue. Sean makes a ruling. Eleanor and Jason deserve to go to the bad place. He uses the Janets as walkie-talkies to send a message to Eleanor and Jason, and if they do not return, he will send Chidi and Tahani to go to the bad place in their place. As much as the joke of Jason being from Florida and that meaning in itself that he should go to the bad place, Miss. like it's a cute joke, and I laugh every time, but it is a letdown that he doesn't even give Jason's case a thorough check. Yeah. Right? It's just, 
I mean, I it's funny, but it just doesn't work because it doesn't make sense. That's not who Sean is. Yeah. Sean would be thorough. Or at least you would think that he would look over Jason's memories or something. Because yeah. if they're able to pull up our Eleanor's memories on that uh, that TV, then he should essentially be able to do the same thing. Yeah. So it's cute joke. Doesn't actually really work in the story, though. Doesn't make sense. No. Um, what did you think of the joke of Janet and Jason trying to figure out how to have sex? Was that cute? Did you like it? Yeah, I think it went on a little bit too long. Okay. Milk that cow a little too much? Yeah, that's probably a position they've tried. Oh, cow milking. Anyway. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's funny because it makes you wonder if Jason's just really bad or whether Janet's just not anatomically designed that way. I assume that it's like a Barbie doll situation under there. So like our previous episode, Michael's a Ken doll. Exactly. Because why would her creators bother adding genitalia? Or nipples for that matter. What's the point? If she's always supposed to be wearing clothes because she's not supposed to be treated as a sexual object. Right. Then why would she have any of them? Mm -hmm. So that's how I imagine it. And that's probably a big letdown for Jason. I do like the joke... Uh, when she starts that beeping sound before the walkie-talkie protocol starts. And he <laughs> yeah. goes, is she having an orgasm? Did I do it somehow? Oh, Jason. Because it's kind of nice to know that he cares about that. Like, that's something, that's a priority for that's him, like I guess. That's a victory for him. But it's also sad that he doesn't have a clue what it looks like. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, I think that's probably the part that I find funniest out of the whole yeah. Janet and Jason want to have sex but can't joke. Yeah. I like all the diagrams. Yes. The the crudely drawn stick figures. Oh, good God. And some of them don't make any sense. Like, one of them is Leapfrog, where she would just, like, I'm assuming jump on his back, and I don't know how that would work. It reminds me a lot of the Lobster Fest episode of Bob's Burgers, with Bob drawing diagrams for Hugo, and they have crudely drawn stick figures as well. Yes. It's, it's fantastic. But, again, we're getting the joke of, like, Jason's like a child. Yeah, you know? um, Jason this episode seems a little written, he, he seems a little dumbed down, like <laughs> a little bit more than usual, which is impressive. Yeah. Because there's... How you, much lower can you go, right? Yeah. There's, sometimes there's some heart, but it just seems like he's, like Jason's getting dumber. Yeah. Really I, quickly. Yeah. And I think they can fix that. I'm hoping that they will. Because he obviously has survived up until his age that he died. Yeah. He knows how to do things. He knows basic life skills. But in this episode, it's kind of like he doesn't. He just doesn't know how to do anything. Yeah, I agree. I want to see more from him. Yeah. Like, yes, he's stupid, but there needs to be something under that. And we've seen little glimpses of it. We know that he thinks of himself as a, as like a, a precious soul and that he needs to flourish and Mm -hmm. that he has weird, but reasonable ish goals. Yeah. So we just need to see him as a more well-rounded character. And last episode, we saw him think of himself as a provider as well. And the inability Mm -hmm. to do that for Janet got him down a little bit. Yeah. So we have seen his heart, like the human version of him. We've seen depth. Yeah. He does have some depth. It's hidden. Under probably like a lot of Cheetos and some video game consoles. and <laughs> But the writers just need to maybe give him a chance. Yeah. Just I think don't it's... use him as comic relief. Yeah. Only comic relief. He's a comedy mule at this point. Yeah. That's pretty much what he does right now. So if you're listening, Megan Amram and Jen Statsky, give Jason better lines. <laughs> <laughs> From one Jason to another. From one Jason to another. Yeah. I do like the music during Jason's attempt to blow up the train because (laughs) when I first watched the episode, I was honestly worried that he would succeed in that moment. So you were on the edge of your seat like, no, 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 Jason, what are you doing? You're ruining everything. Maybe. I didn't know what was going to happen. The good place throws wrenches in, you know, and I like that about it. It uh, keeps me on my toes for sure. So I thought, oh, no, in this moment, I was just worried. Agreed. So 
is kind of funny that it just knocks against it and it's, you know, it loses its flame. But... I have an idea that Jason just filled it with water because he didn't really think of... Oh. He was just like, Molotov cocktail. I've seen it in movies. Right. I'll just put a cloth in a bottle of water and light it and it'll blow up. That's, I guess that's true because the last time we saw him do this in a flashback where he blew up Acid Cat's speedboat, he did ask his friend, hey, pass me that thing that makes it blow up. So it's not like he really understands what it is. Mm -hmm. So maybe he did just fill a bottle of wine, like a cheap, medium bottle of wine in Mindy's kitchen and then just grabbed like one of her dishcloths or something and figured, oh, that'll work, right? Yeah. That's probably fine. Nice try, Jason. Maybe next time. I do want to go back a little bit, though, and talk about Mindy, because when Eleanor grabs her stuff and she's ready to go and she's trying to get Jason to leave, Mindy tells her, well, think practically here. You go back, you get sent to the bad place, and you never see your friends again. If you stay here, you're safe from the bad place, and you never see your friends again. It's the same results. Whether or not they get tortured is their problem. Your problem is whether you get tortured. Right. So I'm going to go on a little philosophy uh, tangent. So come along with me, listeners. Buckle up. Buckle it up or you'll die. <laughs> um, so at first glance, Mindy's morality may be seen as ethical egoism. Ethical egoism is a theory that focuses on how people should or ought to behave. And it focuses on consequences rather than intentions. So Mindy focuses on the results and how they affect Eleanor. Ethical egoism states that we are important, and because we are in the best position to know what is good for us, our moral choices should take into account our own well-being. Right. Nobody knows us better than us. Exactly. Ethical egoism says that the pursuit of self-interest is considered ethically correct, since the theory assumes that everybody acts out of their own self-interest. But it's important that we don't confuse self-interest with selfishness here. So... Ethical egoism, it's, it's telling us, you know, we have to consider our own self-interests and not doing so is unethical. So the difference between that and selfishness would be selfishness is more negative. So it doesn't mean that you should refuse to cooperate with others. It just means that you should choose to cooperate when it benefits your own interests. So a lot of people have the misconception that ethical egoism means that you should just do whatever you want whenever you want regardless of how it will treat other people. Basically, that you should act selfish, right? Mm -hmm. But that's not really what it is. Because you're still, ethical egoism is you're still helping people, but only when it benefits yourself. Yeah, exactly. So you can still do ethical things. Mm -hmm. Yes, in a video I was watching, uh, the, the speaker used this example. He said, all right, so little Timmy is going over to John's house to go play. John has a bunch of Lego. So if John was acting selfishly, he wouldn't let Timmy play with any of his Lego. He would try to keep it all to himself. We know kids like that. We've all, you know, been friends with somebody who was like that. They'd just hoard all their stuff. Yep. But ethical egoism would say that John should share his Lego because it will benefit him in the future. It's in his own self-interest to do that. Because he'll make friends with Timmy. Exactly. He'll be friends with Timmy and then he will be able to receive that same kind of benefit from Timmy later on. So if John knows that Timmy's got this great train track at his house, then when he goes over there, Timmy's going to let him play with that. Mm -hmm. So it is still selfishly motivated. We're still thinking about how it affects you as a person and if it benefits you in some way. But it doesn't mean that you just get to do whatever you want, whenever you want. Mm -hmm. And that you can just be a complete jerk to other people. Right. So an ethical egoist can be an honest and trustworthy person, but only in so far as it will benefit them. Right. So when Mindy tells Eleanor to stay in the medium place, she's urging her to consider her own self-interest. But Mindy doesn't really consider the possibility that not returning to save Chidi and Tahani would actually be a severe detriment to Eleanor's well-being. Right. Right? Because if she doesn't go back, if she doesn't try at least to save them, then Eleanor is going to feel this immense guilt for the rest of her afterlife. Yeah, she'll know that she sent two of her friends to be tortured for all eternity. Exactly. And that in itself would be a form of torture. Right. Right? So 
I get Mindy's point here where she's saying like, you're literally going to be ripped apart every day or you could just not have that happen to you. Like what Jason's motivation is. Like that's what Jason wants. Exactly. Jason is not an ethical egoist. He's just selfish. But Eleanor, I was going to say nice little pointed remark is that she may not be physically ripped apart every day, but she will be emotionally ripped apart just knowing that she never did anything to help her friends. Precisely. And the people who tried to help her, right? Yeah. So now that we have kind of like a general overview of ethical egoism, do you think that Eleanor on Earth was an ethical egoist? Absolutely not. Oh, okay. All right. I don't think she would care whether her actions would benefit her in the long run at all. She would just do things for herself regardless. Okay. Treat people like crap. And treat people like crap when it would benefit her. I think she would... I'll say both. Okay, so she was and she was not? Right, depending on the situation. So if it would benefit her, she would do something for someone. I, I'm trying to think of an example of her doing something ethical when it benefited her. And all okay. I can think of is her doing things just selfishly. So I can't, at this point, think of anything ethical that she's done. Okay. Yeah, and I think that we do see Eleanor acting very selfishly on Earth. That's that's a big problem of hers, right? But there are a lot of the examples where I could see how she is still acting in her own be- like self-interest. Because mm-hmm. Eleanor doesn't want to be friends with people. Right. She pretty much just wants to be left alone. Yeah. So the last flashback that we saw where she refused the birthday cake from her coworkers, this kind of works for me because... In this moment, what she gets out of that situation, she doesn't want anyway, right? Like, if she was to accept the cake, then she would be getting an obligation to continue that tradition along. Yeah. She would probably open herself up to new friendships, which she's not interested in. She doesn't doesn't want want them, right? And not only that, but if she just refuses to get it, gets her own cake, then she gets the cake that she wants and she avoids everything she doesn't want. So that's fine to me. And it's not mean, right? Like, it's not... Right cruel to act that way so is that an ethical decision or is that just purely based on her own self-interest it doesn't have any positive effect for other people it's not benefiting other people it's just benefiting her true i guess it's not so much sharing but maybe sharing of herself right like opening up to people they don't see it like that though no i don't think they do i think they just think she's being mean i think they think she's being standoffish like rude yeah Like, I don't get her. I don't get why she acts this way. Mm -hmm. But to be honest, I get it. Like, if I'm thinking of an example, uh, let's go back to episode two, I believe. We see her at the bar. Right. With her friends. And a ethical egoist would agree to be the DD. Right. Because she knows that when she's drinking next time, somebody else would return the favor and be the DD. That's true. Yes. But she's like, nope, I'm just going to get trashed and not because I found a loophole. Right, right. And house sitting for her rich friend mm-hmm. would benefit her because... Better um, Wi-Fi. Better Wi-Fi. She gets to sit around in a nice house. Yeah, and her friend would see that and possibly repay the favor by, you know, taking her somewhere or doing something nice for her. But she bails on that. So. Okay. I would just purely because she wants to go see Rihanna. Mm -hmm. So all these situations that we've seen, I only see her acting selfishly. I don't see her doing anything that would benefit her by helping somebody. Right. Okay. Or her following through. What do you think about the Andy's coffee situation? Do you think that's that presents like an ethical egoist side? She continues to go there because... It's easy for her. Right. But she doesn't get anything out of it besides... The coffee and the the convenience. Right. So she's not doing something for somebody to get something in return. No, and I'm not saying that that's the only reason you can act as an ethical egoist, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you're acting in your own self-interest. So in this moment, uh, because Eleanor will not be affected by the sexual harassment or the potential scorpions i guess in the coffee then really the detriment to her would be negligible 
So that's, I think, why she chooses to continue going. Because it doesn't affect her. So I think that there are cases where she acts like this, but not enough evidence to say that she was. Right. She was okay. an ethical egoist Agreed. on Earth. Yeah. Okay. I think we're on the same same page here now. Yeah. What do you guys think? Listeners, let us know. Do you think Eleanor is definitely an ethical egoist? Try and convince us. And just going back quickly before we move on, Sean says that Cheaty and Tahani are not completely innocent because they aided and abetted two criminals. What did you think of that? Do you agree with Sean here? No, because these actions happened after they were in the good place. Oh. So if he does this, then he's contradicting himself and what he's judging Eleanor on because he's judging her based on what she did on Earth. Mm -hmm. And then he's going to go and judge Tahani and Chidi based on what they did in the good place. So make up your friggin' mind, bro. (laughs) Come on, Sean. That was so eloquently said. I love it. Yeah, well, you know. I got my scripts from the J-Dog. Oh, my God. (laughs) Um, No, yeah, I agree with you. Actually, I didn't think about that at all. But that's completely unfair. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you're going to judge someone for what they did on Earth, then you you have to use that same metric for everyone else. Yeah. Okay. It's a very good point. All right. We will continue. Eleanor convinces Jason to go back to the good place and own up to their actions. In a flashback, Eleanor emancipates herself from her parents. Eleanor and Jason arrive, but miss the deadline by a few moments. Sean says the bad place is owed two people, and he gives the four of them the task of choosing which two. What? Yeah, that's uh, that's quite the ending. Yeah, it's uh, a great ending. (laughs) It is a really great ending. I did not expect that. It's a good thing that this is a two-parter, because that would have been quite the cliffhanger for a week. Yeah, I'm really glad they didn't do that. (laughs) I'm sorry that we're doing that. <laughs> <laughs> if it was lost, it'd be it's like gonna a three-month break. Oh my gosh. So on the train, while Eleanor and Jason are having their little heart-to-heart, this is our third beat of why are you like that? And in this moment, we get Eleanor actually opening up about it. Mm-hmm. She's not defensive. It's not someone talking behind her back. It's Jason finally asking her and actually wanting an answer. Yeah, he's not like... Why do you like that? God, you're so terrible. Like, it's genuine. Why yeah. Why are you like that? Like, what happened to you? Yeah, there must Who be a hurt reason. you? Oh, who hurt you? Who hurt you? It seemed very Matilda. Oh, yeah. Like, I believe that's very similar to, like, the end scene of Matilda when she signs the adoption papers away. Mm-hmm. Except Eleanor's future is much more lonely. Yes. She doesn't trade one caregiver for another. No. She just But I think she's have happier. One. Like, she's much happier doing this. I don't think she is. The scene we get with her sitting in her new apartment, eating her birthday cake alone, she's looking around, but she doesn't look happy to me. I see. I got, like, I finally did it. Like, I'm finally free. And, you know, I got that feeling, like, of I'm, I'm free of them. I don't have to worry about them. Mm-hmm. But also kind of a, what now? Yeah. No, I, yeah, you're right. You know? So we've talked about this a little bit in the spoiler zone before, but now we know that Eleanor has been living on her own since she was very young, likely 13 or 14. Yeah. Thinking probably closer to 13. And she's made a fairly good life for herself. I mean, she finished school, she went to college, she got a job without any support. Objectively, she is successful with what she does. Yes. Education, work, roof over her head, food, all this stuff. Yeah, without any support. Yeah. Like... She's a resilient person. She has initiative. And it's just, I feel like it's just that she never had anyone to really care about her. So she developed this shell, she you know. She became cold. And distant to people. Yeah. And used this attitude throughout her whole life of, well, if I don't give anyone anything, that they don't owe me anything. And then we're even. Right. It's not a great way to see life, but I think this is... A really great reveal of her past. I actually really like where this went because when she's saying, well, my parents got divorced and they were crappy people, like, I just imagined in my mind that they were parents that fought all the time and then they finally got divorced and she ended up living with mom or dad. Right. But to see that her parents actually didn't care at all, that she wanted nothing to do with them, is really sad. Yeah, her mom's saying we should hang out more often. 
Like, um, hello? I'm your daughter. We should have already been hanging out. Yeah. And her dad, who couldn't give a crap and just wants her to get out of the way. It's it's sad. It's very sad. It's a little sad, but it is a good reveal. Yes. A bit more understanding. I mean, it's it sucks to have that as a life growing up. Mm-hmm. And she says here in this moment, I've been using their crappy parenting as an excuse for my selfish behavior all my life. No more. I freaking cheer every time I see that part because that's it. Like, no more excuses. I have to be better and I'm going to make myself better. Yeah. And honestly, if she was able to have the life she had on earth and be able to take care of herself, she can definitely do this. I 100% believe in her. What do you think about Sean's decision to hand over his power to them and say, hey, you decide? It's funny to me because he's the judge, the end all decision maker. Yeah. And he's frustrated. He's, it's like he's letting emotion get in the way of his own judgment. I don't know. He, I, like, I, I sense a little bit of frustration there, but he says, well, what should I do? I set, you know, I set a timer, but then they didn't make that. So what should I do now? They're all still here. So should it, it doesn't make sense for me to stick with my original. Uh, plan or should I deviate from that plan? Mm -hmm. I don't know. It seems like like he's trying to find a logical way around this. Yeah. But I think he should still be the one making the decision. Yeah. 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 But of course, it makes it so much more interesting that they are. Yeah. Because so. they get to pick who goes home. It's like All Stars season two. Who gets voted off at each week? Yeah. He's referencing drags, Drag Race, by the way. Which would, that was such a huge twist too, right? RuPaul is always the one kicking a queen off, right? Yeah. And then they have to decide, okay, how do I be diplomatic about this? Because some of these other drag queens are my friends, or maybe I should vote off the person who's my biggest threat. Maybe I should just think about how that person did in this particular challenge and not how they were two, three weeks ago, right? So... It's quite the, uh, quite the power and not exactly a gift. And it's, it's a heavy burden. Oh, yeah. That's like the heaviest thing you're going to have to do. Mm -hmm. It's like deciding, well, you're deciding the fate of two of your friends. Right. So these four are obviously the closest at this point. Mm -hmm. They're a team right now. Yeah, they are. All right. Well, I don't have... Pretty much any spoilers for this week because we only have one episode left. Yeah, we're going to skip spoiler section this week. Which is kind of sad. It's our first time without the Spoiler Zone song. You can still sing it. Spoiler Zone. Spoiler Zone. Spoiling spoil everything. Spoiling spoil movies. Spoiling food. There's no Spoiler Zone. Oh, sorry guys. <laughs> hey, the people that never listened to the Spoiler Zone, this is the first time hearing that. Yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. It was a little less enthusiastic. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm still little, sick. It was a little morose. So, and we're, we're just, you know, a little sad that the, the show is ending at yeah, the moment. Yeah, next week's our last episode, so. Yeah. Until season two comes along. Mm-hmm. And next episode will be good. We'll uh, we'll discuss where we think the show is going to go. Yep. And it's your last chance at this point um, to get in your listener feedback. So, if you have questions about uh, anything that's happened this season, honestly. You should let us know quickly because we are actually recording on Sunday. Yes. So get in those questions, get in like your three thoughts. Days. Tell us what you thought of the finale. Now we can finally talk about it. Tell us, what did you think? You know, did you enjoy this finale? Was it kind of a letdown? Was it amazing and you love it to death? Were you spoiled by it by a friend or yeah. the internet and did mm -hmm. it totally bum you out? Yeah. Yeah. So, anyway. That brings us to the end of Forking Bullshirt, a multiverse radio production. If you like our show, please leave a rating and a review on iTunes. This is the best way for others to find the show. And we're hoping to get more and more listeners as the show will go on a hiatus between our final episode for season one and the beginning of season two. Which is September or October? Um, not like, sure. I don't think they've announced a specific okay. date at this point. And like we said, if you have any thoughts you'd like to share, you can find us on Twitter at Multiverse Radio and use the hashtag FBullshirt or find us on Facebook at Multiverse Radio Podcast. And as always, you can send us an email or visit our website, multiverseradio.ca. So we'll see you next week for our final episode of season one 
our review of episode 13, Michael's Gambit, with our special guest. Ooh. So there'll Michael's... be three of us here. Well, in It'll be spirit. Fun. Yeah, in spirit, you know. Yeah. But that's fine. <laughs> It'll be exciting. It'll be very exciting. I'm looking forward to it. Mm-hmm. And you should be too. All right. Thank you so much for listening, guys. I'm Vivian. And I'm Vivian. No, you're not. There can only be one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Jason. And this has been Forkin' Bullshirt. A very subtle Parks and Reference. Parks and Rec. It's a very subtle Parks and Rec reference. Girls with pigtail... Pig... Bleh. Girls... <laughs> oh. Pigtails. <laughs> I love me some pigtails. Ooh, okay. yeah. Girls with pigtails... Pig... Oh my god, I can't do this properly. <laughs> I know, I can't do it right. Okay, hold on. <laughs>